something that is not that good to do in my opinion. Uh, and that's something that is very harmful to the thought process of a human being, how to handle the situation. And the way you and the people are doing it. I don't think that it's something new to do. I don't think you're one of any of the masters mm-hmm. of trying to do this kind of thing with the situation. And this may not work in your case. I don't think that there is a problem with this kind of thing. Mm-hmm. 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 Okay, so what you are looking for is kind of really complicated. So, somebody has to help me get the presentation moving, I think. That's it. All right, well, thank you all very much for coming tonight. I'm honored to be here, especially to be introduced by my good friend, Frank Strada. All the more so because I'm rarely introduced in Dutch. So it sounded like he was saying especially nice things about me. (laughs) Now, this is going to be a talk about quantum physics, but it's also about information. I think we all know that information technology has had an enormous impact on our daily lives. But we also appreciate that technologies that may seem impressive to us today are going to be surpassed in the future by new technologies we really can't expect to imagine today. It's interesting just the same to speculate about future technologies. I might not be the ideal person to engage in that type of speculation. I'm not an engineer. I'm a theoretical physicist. And I can't claim to be deeply knowledgeable about how computers really work. But as a physicist, I do know that the crowning intellectual achievement of the 20th century was the development of quantum theory. And it's natural for a physicist to wonder about how the emergence of quantum theory in the 20th century is going to impact 21st century technology. Quantum physics is not a new thing anymore. We've known about it for a long time. But some of the differences between non-quantum, or as we say, classical systems and quantum systems, we've only come to deeply appreciate relatively recently, especially differences having to do with the properties of information encoded in physical systems. To a physicist, information is something that we encode and store in some physical system, like the pages of a book. But fundamentally, all physical systems are really Quantum systems governed by the rules of quantum physics, and so information is something that we can encode and store in a quantum system. And physicists have appreciated for a long time that information carried by quantum systems has some notoriously counterintuitive properties. That's why we like to speak about the weirdness of quantum theory, and as physicists, we relish that weirdness. But physicists and engineers are now taking more seriously the idea that we can put the weirdness to work to exploit the unusual properties of quantum information to perform tasks that wouldn't be possible if this were a less weird classical world. And that desire to put the weirdness to work has driven the emergence of a new scientific field called quantum information science, which derives much of its intellectual vitality from three main ideas, quantum entanglement, quantum computation, and quantum error correction. And I want to explain those ideas to you tonight. So let's start at the beginning. Uh, You know that any amount of ordinary, conventional information, I'll say classical information, can be expressed in terms of indivisible units, what we call bits of information. And you can think of a bit as an object, like a ball, say, which can be either one of two colors, like red or green. 
And I can store a bit inside a box if I want to. And then later on, when I open the box again, the color ball that I put in comes out again. So you can recover the bit and read it. Now, quantum information, by that I mean information carried by quantum systems, can also be expressed in terms of indivisible fundamental units of information. Uh, we call them quantum bits, or qubits for short. And for many purposes, it's convenient to think of a qubit as an object stored inside a box, but where now I can open the box through either one of two possible doors, marked door one and door two. Those two doors correspond to two complementary ways we might prepare the state of a qubit or observe the state of a qubit. Now, with a qubit, you can put information into the box, store it in the qubit, through either door number one or door number two. And then later on, if you, whoa, that's not good. Uh, When we have quantum computers, this isn't going to happen anymore. <laughs> okay, looks like we're kind of back in business. We did that already. Oops, no, it doesn't like to go past there. You want to, maybe we should try your computer, Frank. You want to try it? It's funny because I, I paged through it uh, before and it seemed to be okay. You want to see if we can uh, get it on there? Thanks. Uh, yeah. No, that doesn't look right. Um, oh, okay. Okay, that's where about where I was. Okay, but I, I want to see if I can get the this to work or. Okay. Okay. I think it's, it's going to be okay. All right, thank you for your patience. Uh, all right, so it is for many purposes convenient to think of a qubit as information stored inside a box, but where now we can open the box through either one of two doors, where those doors correspond to two complementary ways in which we can observe the value of the qubit. I can put information into the qubit through door number one or door number two, and then later on, if I open that same door again, the color that I put in comes out again, just as though it were a classical bit. But if, on the other hand, I store information in a qubit through door number one, and then later on I open door number two, the complementary door, then what comes out of the box is completely random and unpredictable, has an equal chance of being either red or green, irrespective of what color I put through door number one. 
And uh, I think that's, yeah, that's probably my clicker that's asking about. Yeah, never ask. <laughs> I don't. Uh, so to read quantum information, you got to know what you're doing. And if you do it the wrong way, then you'll actually irrevocably damage the information. Now, you can appreciate one consequence of that if you think about copying quantum information. What would it mean to have a quantum copy machine? It would mean that if I happen to have put information through door number one of the qubit, the complicator, the <laughs> copier could make a duplicate of the qubit, and then I could open door number one on the original and the duplicate, and the color that I put in would come out of both boxes. And on the other hand, if I happen to put information in door number two of the qubit and then make a copy, I could open door number two of the original and the duplicate, and the color I put in would come out of both boxes. But in fact, there's no such machine. It's not possible, according to the rules of quantum mechanics, to make a device that can perfectly copy unknown quantum states. And the reason is that the copier, in order to duplicate the qubit, needs to peer inside the box. And if it guesses right and uses the same door that I did, then it can copy the information fine, just as though it were classical. But if it guesses wrong and opens the other door, it will damage the information and there won't be any way to build a high fidelity copy. So you might be able to clone a sheep, but you can't clone a qubit. Now the really interesting differences between quantum and classical information we can't appreciate until we consider states of more than one qubit. Oh wait, before we get to that, I wanted to say, as you can see, I like to think about qubits in kind of abstract terms, but a qubit always has some physical realization, and I'll mention some others later on, but just so you have something concrete to think about. An example of a qubit is a single photon, a particle of light, the photon has an electric field which oscillates and can be oriented in various directions. Um, it could oscillate horizontally or vertically. Uh, those correspond in the language I've been using to the, oops. I don't know. Um, maybe just unplug the uh, HDMI again. Ah, oh, we're back. To the two colors you could see through door number one of the box. But we could also consider the electric field oriented along the 45 degree rotated axes, and that corresponds to observing the qubit through door number two. So what I'm saying in this case is that if I prepare the state in which the electric field is oscillating horizontally, and then I measure the electric field along those 45 degree uh, rotated axes, then I'll just generate a random bit. The really interesting differences between quantum and classical information arise when we consider states of more than one qubit. So let's suppose we have two. They can be far apart from one another. One is in the custody of my lab in Pasadena, California at Caltech. Uh, the other is in the custody of my friend who lives far away in the Andromeda galaxy. And some time ago, these two qubits were both on Earth. And they interacted with one another so as to become correlated in a certain way. And that correlated state has some interesting properties. Namely, I can open my box in Pasadena through either door number one or door number two. And either way, I just see a random color. It has a 50% chance of being red and a 50% chance of being green. And the same is true for my friend in Andromeda. He can open his box through either door, door number one or door number two, and either way, he just sees a random bit. 50% chance of being red and 50% chance of being green. So neither one of us, by opening his box in Pasadena or Andromeda, is acquiring any information about what's inside the boxes. We're just seeing a random bit. And that's peculiar because with two qubits, we ought to be able to store two bits of information. So where is that information hidden in this case? Well, the answer is that for this particular state of the two qubits, all the information is encoded in the correlations between the qubit in Pasadena and the qubit in Andromeda. It turns out for this state that 
if I open door number one and my friend also opens door number one in Andromeda, then we're guaranteed to see the same color. It might be green, it might be red, but it's the same. And likewise, when we both open door number two, we're guaranteed to see the same color. Either we both see green or we both see red. So there are actually four distinct ways in which the qubit with Andromeda could be correlated with the qubit in Pasadena. We could either see the same color or different colors when we both open door number one or we both open door number two. There's four possibilities. We've chosen one of those four, and that's two bits of information encoded in the two boxes. But what's unusual in this case is that information is not available locally when we open the box in Pasadena or in Andromeda. All the information is actually carried non-locally, equally shared between these two distantly separated qubits, which are far, far apart from one another. That feature of quantum information, that it can be shared by systems that are distantly separated from one another, that's what we call quantum entanglement. And it's the really crucial way in which quantum information is different from ordinary classical information. Correlations themselves are not so unusual. We encounter them all the time in daily life. My socks are normally the same color. And that means when you look at my left foot and you observe it, uh, you know already without looking what color sock you'll see when you look at my right foot. And it's kind of like that with the boxes. If I want to know what my friend's going to see when he opens door number one in Andromeda, I can open door number one in Pasadena to find out. And if I want to know what my friend would see when he opens door number two in Andromeda, I open door number two in Pasadena to find out. So it might seem that the boxes are really just like the Soxes, but I insist that they're fundamentally different. And the essence of the difference is that there's just one way to look at a sock. But because we have these two complementary ways of observing the qubit, the correlations of qubits are richer and more interesting than correlations among ordinary bits. This phenomenon of quantum entanglement was first explicitly pointed out by Einstein and collaborators nearly 90 years ago now. And to Einstein, quantum entanglement was something so unsettling as to indicate that something's missing from our current understanding of the quantum description of nature. That paper elicited some interesting responses, including a particularly insightful one from Schrodinger. And the way Schrodinger put it is the best possible knowledge of a whole does not necessarily include the best possible knowledge of its parts. So what Schrodinger meant by that is that even if we have the most complete description that the laws of physics will allow of the pair of qubits, we're still powerless to predict what we'll see when we open the box in Pasadena or open the box in Andromeda. And it was Schrodinger who suggested using the word entanglement to describe these unusual correlations. Schrodinger also said it's rather discomforting that the theory should allow a system to be steered or piloted into one or the other type of state at the experimenter's mercy in spite of his having no access to it. And what Schrodinger meant was, it seems rather strange that it's up to me to decide in Pasadena whether to open door number one and then know what my friend will see if he opens door number one, or to open door number two and then know what my friend will see when he opens door, door number two. But Schrodinger understood that these correlations, though different from ordinary classical correlations, do not allow us to instantaneously communicate between Pasadena and Andromeda. Because when my friend in Andromeda opens his box, he just sees a random bit. And that doesn't convey any information about any action I've taken on my box in Pasadena. Now, the idea of quantum entanglement did not really advance very much for another 30 years until the work of John Bell in the 1960s. And starting with Bell, we began thinking about entanglement in a somewhat different way. Not just as something weird about quantum physics, but something potentially useful, a resource that we could perform, that we could make use of to perform useful tasks. Well, I won't go into the details, but what Bell described was a kind of game that two players, Alice and Bob, can play. It's a cooperative game. Alice and Bob are trying to help each other win. And the way the game works is that Alice and Bob receive inputs, and they are supposed to produce outputs that are correlated in some way that depends on those inputs that they receive. But under the rules of the game, Alice
Alice and Bob are not allowed to communicate with one another between when they receive the inputs and when they produce their outputs. They are allowed to make use of correlated pairs of bits that might have been distributed to them before uh, the game began. Um, and it turns out for this particular game, if they play the best possible strategy, they can win the game with a maximal probability of success, which is 75% if we average uniformly over the inputs that they could receive. But there's also a quantum version of this game where the rules are exactly the same, except Alice and Bob are allowed to make use of entangled pairs of qubits that were distributed to them before the game began. And that shared entanglement allows them to play a better quantum strategy and win the game with a higher probability of success, about 85%. So they use entanglement as a resource. They use it to win this game with a higher probability of success than they could have if they didn't have the shared entanglement. And experimental physicists have been playing this game for decades now and winning with the higher probability of success, which Bell pointed out, the rules of quantum physics allow. So the super strong correlations really are part of nature's design. Einstein had derided quantum entanglement. He called it spooky action at a distance, which sounds even more derisive when you say it in German. But it doesn't really matter whether Einstein likes it or not. Nature is the way experiments reveal her to be, and we should love her as she is. So, boxes are not like socks. If you have entanglement, you can win a game with a higher probability of success, 85% instead of 75%. Is that a big deal? Yes, yes, it's really a big deal. And we can begin to appreciate why it's a big deal if we think about more complex systems with more parts. Imagine I have a book, say it's 100 pages long. And if it's an ordinary classical book written in bits, every time you read one of the 100 pages, you learn another 1% of the information content of the book. And once you've read all the pages one at a time, you know everything that's in the book. But suppose instead it's a quantum book written in qubits where the pages are highly entangled with one another. In that case, when you look at a page one at a time, what you see is just random gibberish, which reveals almost nothing to distinguish the content of one entangled book from another. And even after you've read all the pages one at a time, you know almost nothing about the information content of the book. There's a lot of information in the book, but to read it, you have to make a collective observation on many pages at once. In the quantum book, the information isn't encoded in the individual pages. It's encoded almost entirely in the correlations among the pages. And that's a very different notion of correlation than we're accustomed to in ordinary life. That's what quantum entanglement is all about. And what's so interesting is that these quantum correlations are extremely complex. If I tried to translate this quantum language, the correlations among just a few hundred qubits, into classical language, describing it in terms of ordinary bits, to do so accurately, I would need more bits than the number of atoms in the visible universe. So it'll never be possible, even in principle, to write down the description of a few hundred qubits using ordinary bits. And that feature of quantum information was very intriguing to the physicist Richard Feynman. And it led him to make the suggestion 40 years ago now that if we build a quantum computer that processes qubits instead of bits, it might be able to perform some tasks that far surpass what we can do with our conventional computers. What Feynman had in mind is that if you can't even express in terms of ordinary bits the information content of a few hundred qubits, then by processing the qubits with a quantum computer, we ought to be able to do things that no conventional computer would be able to emulate. And that idea was spectacularly validated in the 1990s by the mathematician and computer scientist Peter Shore, who was studying the problem of finding the prime factors of a large composite integer. That's a problem that we think is hard for conventional computers. As the numbers grow larger, it gets extremely difficult to find the prime factors. But what Shore pointed out is that, at least theoretically, 
If we have a quantum computer, it becomes an easy problem. It's not much harder if you have a quantum computer to find the factors <coughs> than multiplying two numbers together to find their product. And when I heard about this in 1994, I was really awestruck. Because what it's saying is the difference between easy and hard problems, between problems we can solve someday with sufficiently advanced technologies, and problems that are so hard that we'll never be able to solve them, even with much more advanced technology than we have now, that distinction between easy and hard problems is different than it otherwise would be because we live in a quantum world instead of a classical world. And I thought that was one of the most interesting ideas I'd ever heard. And thinking about it eventually led me to change the direction of my own research from elementary particle physics to quantum information science. Now, do people care whether it's easy or hard to factor big numbers? Yeah, they really care. Because the public key crypto systems that we routinely use to protect our privacy when we communicate over the internet are founded on the presumption that the factoring problem and other related number theoretic problems are hard to solve. In a few decades, if quantum computers are widely available, then we won't be able to protect our privacy using those same methods. Alternatives exist, but it's still not entirely clear what's going to be the best way to protect our privacy in the coming post-quantum world. So really what we learned from Feynman and Shore is that there's an important distinction between types of problems. There are problems which are too hard to solve with classical computers, but which can be efficiently solved by quantum computers. And it becomes a compelling question to understand what are these problems that are classically hard and quantumly easy? And we've learned a few things about that in the last 25 years. I think we have a lot more still to learn. But if you're a physicist, there's a natural place to look for such problems because we believe that with a quantum computer, we'd be able to efficiently simulate any process that occurs in nature. And we don't think that's true of conventional computers, which can't simulate very highly entangled quantum matter. And that means with quantum computers, we should be able to go further in probing the properties of complex molecules and exotic materials, and also probe fundamental physics in new ways. For example, understanding the quantum properties of a black hole, or what happened in the early universe right after the Big Bang. So a lot of intellectual effort over the last 25 or so years has gone into finding applications we can run on quantum computers. One of the people contributing to uh, that effort is my friend Eddie Farhi, well, like me, originally a particle physicist, and when he wrote one of his characteristically brilliant papers a few years back, I was inspired to write a poem, which read in part, we're very sorry, Eddie Fari, your algorithm's quantum. Can't run it on those mean machines until we've actually got them. And the poem goes on, but you get the idea. People were working very hard to find applications to run on quantum computers and couldn't run them because we didn't have quantum computers. But now we're getting to the point where quantum computers are capable at least potentially, of running interesting applications, and that's making the subject more exciting than ever. The fact is, though, that it's been 40 years since Feynman suggested the idea of a quantum computer, and we're just now getting to the point where quantum computers are getting interesting. So evidently, making a quantum computer is hard. It's taking a while. Why is it taking so long? Well. In part, it's because the formidable enemy of a quantum computer is what we call decoherence. So what does that mean? Physicists like to imagine a cat, which is both dead and alive at the same time. I don't know why, but we like to imagine that. Uh, but you never see that type of superposition of macroscopically distinct objects in ordinary life, and we understand why not. It's because such a cat would immediately interact with its environment, the molecules in the room, the light in the room. And those interactions would, in effect, immediately measure the cat and project it onto a state which is either completely dead or completely alive. So those are the states of the cat that we really see. That's the phenomenon of decoherence. And it actually helps us to understand why it is that even though quantum physics holds sway at the 
microscopic scale at the scale of atoms. Nevertheless, classical physics provides a very accurate description of what we ordinarily experience. Now, a quantum computer won't otherwise be so much like a cat, but it too will interact with its environment, though we'll try hard to prevent it, and those interactions will cause the quantum computer to decohere for the quantum information encoded in that computer to be damaged, and as a result, our computation won't give the right answer. So if we're going to operate large-scale quantum computers reliably, we have to have a way of fighting off the destructive effects of decoherence and other potential sources of error. Well, errors can be a problem even in the classical world, as we all know. Uh, we all have bits that we value highly, but everywhere there are dragons lurking who delight in damaging our bits. And um, in the classical world, we've learned ways of fending off the dragons. If I have some bit that I cherish, one thing I can do is store backup copies of the bit. And then a dragon might come along and flip the color of one of those three balls. But I can ask a busy beaver to frequently check the balls. And whenever she sees that one's a different color than the other two, she repaints that one so that all three match again. So as long as the dragon hasn't had a chance to damage two out of the three balls, the information is protected from the dragon. And because it's redundantly encoded, it can be robustly stored. We'd like to apply that same idea that robust encoding protects against error to quantum information. Well, at first there seem to be obstacles. For one thing, as I already emphasized, we can't copy unknown quantum states perfectly. And so I can't, in the middle of a quantum computation, store a backup copy of what's in the quantum, what's in the quantum memory in case the original gets damaged. And also there are more things that can go wrong with quantum information than with ordinary classical information. The dragon might come along and open door number one of a qubit and flip the color of the ball and reclose the box. That would be like a bit flip that occurs in classical information. But alternatively, the dragon could open door number two of the box and change the color of the ball and reclose the box. That's what we call a phase error in the quantum information, which really has no classical analog. But we need to be able to protect against that type of error as well if we want our quantum memory to remain error free. Furthermore, there's another way of thinking about these phase errors. It might be that the dragon opens door number one of the box and instead of flipping the color of the ball, observes the color and remembers it. And that actually has the effect of changing the color of the ball if we observe it through door number two instead. And in many physical situations, it's easier for the environment to remember the value of a bit than to flip the bit. And for that reason, these phase errors are particularly prevalent in many physical situations, and we have to learn to protect against them. So really, the problem is, there's something fundamentally different about quantum information than classical information. Namely, when you observe a quantum system, you unavoidably damage the state of the quantum system, which isn't necessarily the case for ordinary classical systems. And that means if we want to execute a quantum computation reliably, we need to make sure the environment doesn't observe the quantum information. We need to keep our quantum data nearly perfectly isolated from the outside world if we're going to do a reliable quantum computation. And that's very difficult because our hardware is never going to be perfect. But what we've understood is that, at least theoretically, it's possible to protect a quantum computation from damage at the level of software by modifying the way we process the information. Specifically, if I have a qubit that I'd like to protect from damage, what I can do is encode that qubit in a highly entangled state of five qubits. And then the dragon might come along and observe or damage in some arbitrary way one of those five qubits. But because this is an entangled state, by observing one of the five qubits, the dragon doesn't acquire any information about what the encoded state is, just like in that 100-page book. You couldn't read the book by looking at one page at a time. 
And so, since no information is acquired by the dragon, no damage necessarily has to occur to the encoded state. And I can then ask the beaver to come along and make some careful collective observations on all the five qubits, which reveal which one of the qubits was damaged and what needs to be done to repair the damage. That's how quantum error correction works. So the essential idea is that if we want to protect quantum information from damage, we should encode it in a very highly entangled way. The environment interacts with the system locally, one part at a time. And because the encoding is highly entangled by interacting locally, the environment doesn't learn what the encoded data is and therefore needn't damage it. And furthermore, we've understood how to efficiently process information that's encoded in this highly entangled manner. So although we may not see a real ca cat, which is dead and alive at the same time, we should eventually be able to produce an encoded cat, which is a superposition of dead and alive and maintain that encoded state in a delicate superposition for as long as we please using the ideas of quantum error correction. When we were working on the idea of quantum error correction in the 1990s, it was an exciting time. I had a student in those days, Daniel Gottesman, and he was so excited about quantum error correction that he wrote a sonnet about it. It said, in part, we cannot clone for force, and said we split coherence to protect it from that wrong that would destroy our valued quantum bit and make our computation take too long. And being a sonnet, it goes on. But you get the idea, we were excited. Quantum information seemed to be a fundamental insight about nature, that we could make big complicated quantum systems maintain their quantumness despite the inevitable interactions with the environment. Well, that was the 1997 when Daniel wrote his PhD thesis, and so it's been 25 years. And we're just now getting to the point where we can start to explore quantum error correction and how well it works in the lab with real devices. So where are we now? Well, first of all, there are a number of different approaches to building quantum hardware which are being pursued in parallel and are steadily advancing. I already mentioned the possibility of encoding information with photons. Uh, I could use as a qubit a single electron, the magnetic field of a single electron, or a single atom, which could be in either its ground state or some very long-lived excited state. Those are remarkable encodings because the information is being held by very elementary objects, one electron, one atom. But thanks to technological advances over the last few decades, we've learned to control those systems pretty accurately. Or the, infor the information could be encoded in some more complex way for example, in the state of an electrical circuit at very low temperature that conducts electricity without resistance. And that's also a remarkable encoding since it involves the collective motion of billions of pairs of electrons. And yet for information processing purposes, it can behave just like a single atom. Now, as I've emphasized, as far as we understand, Classical systems, like classical computers, cannot in general efficiently simulate quantum systems like quantum computers. And I think that's the most interesting thing we've ever said about the difference between quantum and classical systems. There's a very strong incentive to validate that in the laboratory to the extent that we can do so. And in 2019, the Google Quantum AI group announced with some fanfare that they had achieved a demonstration of the superiority for information processing purposes of a quantum computer over a classical one. What the Google group did is they built a quantum processor called Sycamore, which has 53 working superconducting qubits laid out in a two-dimensional array such that I can perform entangling operations on any neighboring pair of qubits in that array. And they performed up to 20 layers of those entangling operations in this device, and then measured all the qubits, generating a 53-bit string. 
Now, this is a noisy device because the quantum computers we have now are far from perfect. So, in fact, 499 times out of 500, when they run this computation, they just get random junk. One in 500 times, they actually get a valid result. But they can repeat the same computation over and over again millions of times in just a few minutes and then extract a statistically useful signal from the quantum computer. Simulating what that quantum computer is doing with the classical computer is extremely difficult. In fact, it hasn't been done. It's estimated that it could be done with an exascale supercomputer, the most powerful supercomputers that currently exist. In, um, it could be done in a reasonable um, amount of time. But the classical system covers two tennis courts and is consuming megawatts of power. Sycamore is just one little chip nestled inside a very cold refrigerator. And furthermore, as we increase the number of qubits, the difficulty of simulating what the quantum computer is doing with a classical computer continues to grow exponentially. So with, say, 70 or more qubits, the simulation of what the quantum computer is doing with a classical computer would really be far out of reach for some time into the future. Now, the particular task that Sycamore performs is not of particular practical interest, except for the purpose of demonstrating the superiority of the quantum computer. Nevertheless, this is something of a milestone, as it indicates that our quantum technology has reached the point where quantum computers can produce meaningful results in the regime where simulating what the quantum computer is doing with our most powerful classical computers is extremely difficult. It's useful to have a word for the new era of quantum computing, which is now dawning. The word NISC has kind of caught on. It means noisy intermediate scale quantum. Intermediate scale, meaning these are devices of sufficient size, say with 50 or more qubits, that we can't by brute force simulate with our classical computers what the quantum computer is doing. Noisy is to remind us that these systems are not error corrected. And the noise is a serious limitation on their computational power. It limits the number of steps in a computation we can perform and still get useful signal to noise out of the quantum computer. Now, for physicists, NISC is exciting. It means we now have a tool for investigating the properties of highly entangled quantum matter in a regime that has never been experimentally accessible before. And it may be that this NISC technology will have practical applications, but we're still not sure about that. We shouldn't expect NISC computers to change the world right away. It should be regarded as a step towards the more powerful quantum computers we're hoping to develop in the future. I do think that quantum computing will eventually have a transformative impact on society, but we're not sure how long it's going to take to get there. It could be decades. There is an emerging paradigm of how a quantum computer based on near-term technology might be used to do something practical. It's a kind of hybrid quantum classical scheme. It makes sense to use our powerful classical computers to the extent that we can, and then try to boost that power with a quantum coprocessor. It might work like this. A quantum computation of modest size is performed, all the qubits are measured, those measurement outcomes are then fed to an ordinary classical computer, which returns instructions to slightly modify the quantum computation. And that cycle is iterated many times until convergence, where the goal is to find the minimum of some cost function for the purpose of solving an optimization problem, like a scheduling problem or optimizing a financial portfolio. Now, we don't expect that quantum computers would be able to efficiently find exact solutions to very hard instances of these combinatorial optimization problems. But it's possible that quantum computers can find better approximate solutions or find those solutions faster. So should we expect that this type of NISC quantum computer will be able to outperform the most powerful classical computers we have? Uh, where the classical computers are running the best algorithms to 
um, solve the same problems? Well, we don't really know. We can try it and see how well it works, but it's really a lot to ask because the classical algorithms are very well honed after decades of development, and these next processors are just becoming available for the first time recently. Now, we don't necessarily have to be so discouraged that theorists haven't been able to give us any theoretical guarantees that a NISC quantum computer will be able to run impactful practical applications. We know lots of instances in conventional computing where there were algorithms which turned out to be practically useful, even though theorists weren't able to validate the usefulness of those algorithms in advance. A current example is deep learning. It's having a big impact. It allows us to drive automated vehicles, to process human language, to play Go, and so on. But theorists have a very limited understanding of why it is that for many applications of interest, deep learning networks can be efficiently trained. And for a while, quantum computing is probably going to be like that. We have some heuristic ideas about things we can try on quantum computers with no theoretical guarantee that we'll actually see a quantum advantage. But we can try those things out and experiment. And as we learn more about the capabilities of quantum computers, that may direct us towards useful applications. It's going to be challenging, though, to find practically useful applications given the limitations of the near-term technology where we expect in the next few years we'll have maybe hundreds of qubits and we'll be able to run computations with maybe of order 100 steps. So it'll really require a vibrant discussion among the hardware providers, the algorithm experts, and the potential end users to search for potentially impactful practical ap applications of NIST technology. Now, if we look further ahead to when we have much more accurate quantum computers, which are not so noisy, then we can, perhaps somewhat optimistically, envision that with a quantum computer with just a few hundred um, very good qubits, meaning I can perform very accurate two qubit operations in such a quantum computer, uh, there are applications to, say, chemistry and material science and optimization where we can expect to see that the quantum computer has an advantage over the best classical algorithms. But the catch is that this would be true if we had perfect qubits and perfect gates, and we don't. In the quantum computers we have now, the typical probability of error every time we apply an entangling operation to a pair of qubits is about 1%. We can see that being improved to about 0.1%, perhaps, in the next few years. But even so, if we wanted to run some of these applications where we think the quantum computer will have a clear advantage using those noisy quantum computers with an error rate per gate of 0.1%, in order to have sufficient redundancy in how the quantum information is stored that the quantum computation will be sufficiently accurate, we may need thousands of physical qubits per protected logical qubit in such a computation. So the total number of physical qubits that we'll need may be in the millions. And that's a rather daunting leap from where we expect to be in the next few years with hundreds or maybe thousands of physical qubits to the millions of physical qubits that we may need to see a clear quantum advantage. Meanwhile, we should continue to try to improve the performance of the hardware. Can we get a much better gate error rate than 0.1%? It's very hard to do. But there are a number of approaches that people are thinking about which potentially could give much more reliable gates. Um, I've listed some of the ones I'm partial, I'm partial to here. I won't explain them in detail. But they all have in common that some of the protection against error is designed into the hardware itself rather than applied in software at the next level up. All of these ideas are still in their early stages. People are trying them out in the lab. We don't know how well they're going to pan out. But it's really important to keep trying, because if we had much more accurate gates, uh, that would extend the range of NISC information processing. It would mean we'd be able to run longer computations with reasonable error rates. 
and it will also eventually lower the overhead costs of doing error-corrected quantum computing in the more distant future. Part of what will improve the performance of our hardware would be advances in material science. Those require a lot of time and investment, and the pace of progress is hard to predict. At any rate, we need more than just better materials. We also need better ideas about how to make use of the properties of exotic materials to improve the performance of our qubits. What will be the long-term impact on humankind of quantum computing? Well, nobody knows that. We can't be expected to know what in the long term will be the most important consequences for society of a wholly new way of doing information processing. But of the applications we can currently clearly foresee, those that seem to have the best potential to benefit humanity are the applications to chemistry and materials, which have the potential to improve human health and energy production and agriculture and the sustainability of our planet. But it's not going to be easy and it's not going to be fast. We have enormous technical problems to solve to realize our aspirations in quantum computing. And it's going to take sustained effort and investment over decades to realize our aspirations. So I've mostly been talking about three questions about quantum computers tonight. Why do we want to build one? Well, I don't think we know what the most important implications are ultimately going to be. The best answer we can currently give is that we think a quantum computer will be able to simulate efficiently any process that occurs in nature, and we don't think that's true of conventional computers, which can't simulate highly entangled matter. Will we really be able to build quantum computers, scale them up to systems that can solve really hard problems? Well, if the principles of quantum physics as we currently know them are valid, then since we now understand the idea of quantum error correction, we don't see any obstacle that will prevent us from scaling up to those large, much more powerful systems. And how will we build them? Well, we don't know that either. As I've emphasized, there are a number of different approaches to building quantum hardware that are advancing in parallel. And it's important to continue to try a variety of technologies, because we really can't know at this stage which approach has the best potential for scaling up to large systems that can solve really hard problems. It might be a hardware approach that we haven't even thought of yet. It might be a hybrid of different technologies, which turns out to have the best performance. Now, these questions make for a pretty compelling research agenda, and a lot of what I've worked on in the last 25 years targets these questions. But I'm not an engineer, I'm a theoretical physicist, and what really excites me the most is that ideas about quantum computing and quantum information are giving us new approaches to thinking about nature at a fundamental level. The way I like to think about quantum information science is that we're just in the early stages of exploring a new frontier of the physical sciences, what we might call the complexity frontier or entanglement frontier. This is different from the short distance frontier we explore in fundamental particle physics or the long distance frontier we explore in cosmology. But like those, it's very fundamental and exciting. We are now developing and perfecting the tools for creating and precisely controlling very complex states of matter, highly entangled states, far too complex to simulate with the most powerful conventional computers we currently have, and we don't have the right theoretical ideas for thinking about how these systems behave, and that opens potential for new discoveries. A particular area that has attracted or made use of many of the ideas of quantum information is the community of people who think about gravity at a fundamental quantum level. There's a community that for decades has been trying to understand the properties of black holes. When we think of black holes as quantum objects, What's inside a black hole? What happens at the so-called singularity at its interior? What happens to information that falls into a black hole? Is it ever able to escape again? We still don't, after decades of effort, have the definitive answers to these questions. But pondering them has generated a very 
fundamental and compelling idea called the holographic principle. And what the holographic principle asserts is that contrary to naive expectations, all the information in a room, like this auditorium, all the information in our brains and our smartphones and our computers can, in principle, be read at the boundary of the room on the walls and the floor and the ceiling. But in a highly scrambled form that's extremely hard to read. And what we think we've understood is that the geometry in the room, the information about which objects or people are in close uh, proximity to other objects, that geometry is encoded in the structure of the quantum entanglement in this boundary description. So in a profound sense, it seems that quantum entanglement is what holds space together. And a recent Caltech event, Robert Digraff, the director of the Institute for Advanced Study, uh, gave a talk about how the ideas of theoretical physics are united. And he showed this slide, which uh, I found striking, because he put quantum information right at the center of things. And I don't think Digraff would have done that a few years earlier, because the idea that quantum information is a unifying concept of physics has gained traction only relatively recently. But where I would depart from Digraph is I'd erase the word theoretical, because quantum information is very much an experimental science. And if it's true, as we increasingly believe, that the properties of quantum space-time are emergent from a more fundamental description of very highly entangled matter, then it should be possible in the not too distant future to gain insights into quantum gravity by performing experiments with highly entangled matter in the laboratory, in effect, creating space-times that didn't exist before and pro probing and understanding their properties. Whether that prophecy turns out to come true or not, I think we can be very confident that many delightful surprises and discoveries await us as we explore the entanglement frontier. Thanks for listening. <laughs>